Welcome to the Elevate Your Equity podcast, where we, as married busy professionals, leverage real estate investing to unlock the three plus one degrees of freedom, health, location, time, and financial. And today we are honored to have a supreme power couple on the show with us. We've got Ava and August on the show. How are you guys today? Doing fantastic. Doing Thank great. you so much for having yeah, us. Guys. It couldn't be better because now we're talking about two of our favorite topics is being a couple in business and also the, you know our line of business, which, which is real estate private equity. So super excited to talk about it. Excellent. Very cool. Well, I have your guys' intro right here, but I'll tell you what, why don't you guys just take a second to introduce yourselves to the audience? Yeah, for sure. Please. So yeah, I'm, I'm Ava Benesaki, CEO of CPI Capital. Um, CPI Capital, we partner with passive investors as limited partners, and we purchase U.S. multifamily assets. We're also both host and co-host of <laughs> Canadian Passive Investing Academy, where we interview experts and we talk all about real estate investing and wealth building topics. And yeah, we're both thought leaders in this space. So that's a little bit about me. Definitely, yes. I'm myself, August Biniaz, co-founder of CPI Capital. I manage the day-to-day -day operations of CPI Capital. CPI Capital is a, a real estate private equity firm, like Ava mentioned. Our mandate is acquiring U.S. multifamily assets with a value-add component. Our business is somewhat unique because we partner with Canadian investors and U.S. investors as our uh, limited partners, as our investors to, to acquire these properties. We're also big on creating content and being educators within the space, because when we started out a while back, we, we noticed that there wasn't a lot of content, particularly in Canada here when it comes to the concept of syndication or uh, real estate private equity. So we were excited to try and be leaders in the space. Yeah, it's great to have you guys on. Um, I think that it's a very unique uh, space to be able to talk to U.S. investors and Canadian investors both at the same time here because you guys specialize in kind of both of these and you can kind of dip your hand in both, which is what I think is super, super cool. So let's just start like we always do at the beginning. I want to find out more about how you two got interested in real estate investing. Maybe one of you got started and the other convinced the others or maybe you got started together. I just want to hear that story from the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah, our story is pretty Pretty awesome. I mean, what do you say about luck always, Ava? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. <laughs> and, and I think in this situation, that was exactly what took place because um, we were both real estate professionals for a long time, close to a decade for Ava, myself, 16 years, 17 years, approximately being involved in real estate. Uh, and then when we got together uh, as real estate professionals, we realized a problem that existed in our space which but then it was the impetus for creating CPI Capital. But yeah, if I can go briefly into our background in real estate, if you guys wish, myself at least. Yeah, so my background mm -hmm. in real estate, I started 16, 17 years ago as a licensed agent. I think uh, being a broker is a great way to start uh, you know, in real estate. Uh, I wasn't really good at being a real estate agent, but I was good at, fi you know, good at finding deals. Um, so I started, eventually started um, uh, my own general contracting company, you know, doing small fix and flips moved on to build, build single family luxury homes, more on the luxury side, and then eventually wanted to scale and got into ground up development for multifamily. And that's right around the time where I met with Ava. And it was around the same time that I ha had a need for substantial amount of equity for my larger projects where I didn't have access to. The debt was there, but the equity wasn't. So I was always looking for ways to, to get my hands on more equity and then that's when I met Ava and we together kind of uh, realized a problem that exists in our space. Yeah, and, and my background, I started in real estate when I was young. I was about 22 years old and I helped many, many investors invest in real estate. And when August and I came across real estate syndication, this concept where we could still help investors, but invest passively in these larger assets where they're building wealth passively, we fell in love with the concept. And I ended up kind of talking to all my investors who wanted to invest in real estate, but didn't want to be active, right? So we're like, this is amazing. We could build an incredible <laughs> company here and we can help a lot of people going this route now. So let me ask you guys, is the concept of syndication something that can be done in Canada easily? Because I want to make sure that everyone understands the listeners. Most of our listeners are US based, but I know there's some people that are in Canada that are following us now, especially since our last acquisition, which we can get into a little bit more later. But in Canada, is the syndication concept the same? And did you guys both look at it that same way as we understand it now in the United States? 
Sure. Yeah. Let's break down syndication briefly for viewers that might not understand the concept. So syndication is a broad term. So it means that two groups coming together for to achieve the same goal. Uh, one of the groups is bringing the equity, their silent partner, and the other part of the group is bringing the knowledge and expertise needed to uh, complete the project. So that's essentially what syndication is. So yeah, syndication does exist in Canada. Now, if you're looking at it on the corporate structure side and the compliance side of it, as far as raising capital and working with silent partners who are 100% passive, yes, that structure also, uh, those structures and the processes also exist in Canada as well. Obviously the compliance side of it, in the US you have certain exemptions, but the, the concept is the same. So both the US Securities and Exchange Commission and the Canadian Provincial Securities Commissions say that, okay, great, if you wanna raise capital, you have a business idea, you wanna raise capital for your business idea, you need to go through an IPO. You know, initial public, you need to be a public trader, raise the capital you need for your company. But then that process is very cumbersome, is expensive, mm -hmm. it takes some time. So both commissions say, okay, great, fine. If this process is too expensive for you when you wanna buy an apartment building, I'll allow you to use some exemptions. Now on the US side, there are certain exemptions that work perfectly when it comes to buying apartment buildings or buying real estate with a sponsor and investors. Also in Canada, there are ex exemptions that exist that a real estate investment firm can use to partner with passive investors. So yes, there are both exemptions on both sides, not exemptions that are a bit different, requirements are a bit different, and we can get into that a bit more, but overall somewhat similar. Thank you for, for framing that. And I think that's that's awesome and gives us a lot of context for what we want to discuss a little bit later. But I think what I wanted to get back to is you guys as a couple, right? You guys are both real estate professionals. It sounded like you both had an interest in the real estate field for quite some time. How did this business start? Uh, I know that there was some interest, like Eva, you said that you found some people that are interested in syndication. It blew your mind. But how did you guys start working together? Like, can you tell us the genesis of, of how that happened? Yeah, for sure. I'll say the starting part of it. So, so when we met, like, like I said, it was uh, like Ava mentioned, there was a lot of luck involved because when we got to meet each yeah. other, there was a lot of compatibility points between us. One of them was we both loved exercise. We both loved diet and taking care of our physical and mental health. We were both very athletic, you know, and, and, and he finally, um, he thought he was a quick runner until he met me and then I, I, I beat him yeah, every time. I've never <laughs> seen as fast as a runner as Ava said, so, and I mean like speed, like speed running and a lot of other stuff. And I mean, and also the kind of open mindedness and, you know, trying new sports together and what have you. So, so there was, we were very compatible at that point. And right when we met, I was involved in ground up development as a developer and she was a real estate agent. So that's also a perfect chemistry because, you know, somebody yeah. who builds real estate and somebody who sells real estate, that's a perfect marriage as well. So in that sense, it, it was great, but I was right around the time where I was transitioning to be more involved on the raising capital side of it and finding deals uh, was introduced to this concept of, uh, you know, as, as a builder, as a developer, I got invest into real estate projects and build them from the ground up. But when I realized about the world of real estate, private equity, or this concept of syndication, it was a bit different. It was finding a deal, finding investors, finding all the contractors and getting compensated relative to the performance of the asset. So I fell in love with that concept and I was pursuing a bit more. And when we got together, that's when, you know, Ava was like, she was investigating what I'm up to. She was kind of totally. Uh, and I'm like, I'm like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This is amazing. What am I, 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 I love helping people. And we both have like this really strong entrepreneurial hearts, the two of us. Um, so I am like, Hey, this, this is incredible. And then again, we started when we were talking and talking, we're like, we can build an incredible company here through real estate syndication. So it was about a year after I completely left my career and he left his career and we went head first in building our our company from the ground up with both of our entrepreneurial hearts and minds it, it just worked out like two peas in a pod you have too, too many stars aligned also the city yeah. we were living in the medium income is around ninety thousand. medium home price is around 1.1 million dollars so it's difficult for people to invest in real, real estate and reinvest in real estate so we, uh, you know she was feeling that that pain from Absolutely. a broker side, yeah. I was feeling the same pain on on a development developer side of it. I was having issues as well uh, for the ground up because of the, the time it took to do a ground up development dealing with the city. So there was also alignments when it came to that concept, that and part of it. Ten well. years of helping real estate investors invest in real estate. Everybody's taught put your money into real estate, but a lot of people it's a frustrating experience for them because yeah they want to invest in real estate but they don't have the time knowledge or expertise. So when you start talking about 
fractional real estate investing, real estate syndication. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't have been a better vision that we had for ourselves. Yes. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I just love hearing you guys speak. It's so lovely. I hear the synergy and, and just the compatibility. And I want to um, ask you both. So it sounds like you both came in with really strong real estate skills in general. Now, as you're forming the company, how did you start to leverage each other's strengths and skills and, and decide who's going to be doing what? How did that kind of happen organically? Can you talk about that a little bit? Excellent question. Excellent question. Yeah, for sure. So go ahead. Yeah. For me, I always my kind of my superpower is creating relationships with people and and really getting some tight bonded strong relationships forming. So I knew right away that I was going to be the person dealing with the investors. August is like one of those people who like I'd say like ten times a day. Oh my god, I just came up with another incredible idea. Oh my god, I just came up with another amazing idea. <laughs> so he was. I already knew right away, like, hey, he's going to be the guy to, to take this company to the next level and, and really decide, like, go ahead. I'm trying to. Yeah, do no, no, you're saying it perfect. Because yeah. no, her personality, I mean, she comes from a small town. She moved to Vancouver to the big city a few years ago. She has that small town mentality, that small town feel. A lot of very, you know, trustable individual. And that trust exists there. Me, my background as a contractor, I'm more straightforward. I'm very laconic might not be best uh, when when dealing with investors because I'm, I'm just used to dealing with contractors and suppliers i'm very black and white so i'm a great person for finding deals dealing with operating partners dealing with asset managers yeah. you know dealing with other contractors that are working with us because i'm uh, you know i'm very straight to the point and and very black and white but she's great like i mean the, and also her, her mindset dealing with investors is a lot different than mine i, I mean one time I, I remember a situation where there were our monthly distributions were about to be sent out on a, on a certain day we always send them on on the 15th and there was a delay in us receiving the funds and and then the funds came in later on we still had an hour to rush to the bank and finalize it i'm like hey it's fine we'll just send it over tomorrow the funds are already in our account and it was like no no no, we're going there today so did we initially start cpi and right away say yes ava is going to be head of investor relations and august is going to be on operations and and the acquisition and management side not really it just it ended up naturally. being a way that, that happened naturally. Initially, yeah. I was talking to investors yeah. uh, because I was contacting my base of investors, but it's interesting how it evolved on its own yeah. and we fell into where we excelled. Yes. Oh, amazing. And August, you spoke about mindset. And so I want to ask you both too, what is the mindset that and the foundation that needs to be in place for a husband and wife couple to create something as successful as you guys have created? Yeah, for sure. I think the mindset is just pure willingness to under like be open to the, what the other person is saying, right? Communication is key and understanding like it's we both have the best interest to grow the company. Um so just hearing each other out and and really just kind of communicating all day long <laughs> and we, having we, a lot of systems yes. in place. We're on video and audio being recorded currently. <laughs> so I could, I could come here and say, oh, it's great. It's all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> but I will tell you, it's, it's an extremely difficult dynamic to manage a husband and wife, also company owners. You get into a disagreement with, with, with your partner. You guys go your separate ways and then you talk about it again, again tomorrow. Yeah. But I got to have dinner with that person. I got to go to bed with that person. So that issue, that disagreement we had at work cannot be left at work is there it exists yeah. uh, so i would not recommend it really for a husband and wife to get into a business setting unless they're already so connected and they can yeah. resolve problems in the past if you're having difficulties in your relationship and things are, and this is my perspective i mean it could be different from others but my prescription for this would be if, if you're having difficulties in your relationship and you want to bring business into it now, oh, that's, that could be disastrous. So, yeah, uh, you know. well said. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, you guys. And I think that, you know, we get a lot of uh, questions about people wanting to work together with their spouse because we talk so much about the power of being able to work together with your spouse if it works out like you guys are saying. And I think a lot of times it starts with an open mind, right? And, and understanding what drives your spouse and what drives you. And then having that conversation to understand what is that you want together and what sacrifices are willing to make. And, you know, there's a time frame, there's a plan, there's things that can be put together. But August, I 100% agree that if you're already at each other's throats, you should not be work looking to start a business. There's some prerequisite work or homework that you yeah. should be doing <laughs> beforehand, right? 100%. Yeah. 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 What would some of that prerequisite homework be from your guys' perspective, yeah. you know, in for new couples starting out who are saying, huh, maybe we want to try this? 
Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, it really got to figure out what is your vision, right? We we had the same vision about, you know, building this company, putting our whole entire hearts and soul into it, being okay with working the long hours. It's not like I want to go and, you know, take a whole day off and he's like wants to work. We're actually really much aligned that way. Hey, we're going to dedicate our whole lives to this. And then we're also, you know, we were really aligned with when we wanted to start a family and kind of what we want our lives to look like. So you have to be aligned with your vision and your day to day vision vision and your future vision, right? Definitely. For me, I think one of the tests is, do you enjoy spending a lot of time with your significant other? Totally. Some people have their own lives. They either play on some sports teams or they have their own uh, social times that they go and hang out. And with others, the wife hangs out with her friends or has her own social life. And then the husband also the same <laughs> way. And you know, the time they spend might not be a lot, but in business, now you're spending a lot of time together. Do you enjoy spending a majority of your time with this person? And for us, even prior to starting business, we noticed that as soon as we met, you know, we, we enjoy doing things together. We, I think we, we were we attached by the hip for 24 hours we, a day. We were attached <laughs> by the hip. Even so much so our families were like, you guys got to get your own hobbies. We're like, no, we actually enjoy doing <laughs> That's so hobbies. great. So we actually knew, yeah, that's a really good point, right? Yes. You got to make yes. sure that you want to spend a lot of time. With yeah, some people just <laughs> need their own space. They need their own social life. They need their own friends. I recommend that as well. Yes. But, yeah. uh, you know, as soon as you start a business with your significant other, now you're spending just so much time together. And that could be difficult for some. For us, it came naturally. We just enjoyed spending time. And that was tested at the beginning of our relationship because she was the first, you know, girlfriend, wife. I, well, you were definitely the first wife I ever had, but uh, the, the first, the, the first, good the, the that first, is good. Girl, All right. the, the first girlfriend, you know, at the time that I had that I actually enjoyed spending a lot of time with. So I knew that, Hey, business comes into this. It won't be uh, you know, much yeah, more for sure. And it can, keep in mind, it can be really exciting building a company and a, and with your significant other, because again, your visions are aligned. So you can do everything together and build the life of your dreams together as, as, as opposed to having a business partner that has their own, you know, the communication might be a little bit off. It doesn't always have to be, but you know what I mean? You're like, you know, yeah. for sure that this is the person that you're going to be. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's like an extra layer to, uh, to the level of communication that you bring to the table and having a, that dimension maybe is another way of phrasing it. Uh, that sounds like that's that's really, really important for a long lasting business and romantic relationship. And I, I think that you guys have found the formula for success. So that's really, really good. And, you know, I wanted to also ask too, this is just a, a trivia question for me, but it didn't sound like you guys, when you started working together, you were like dating, right? Like you found out what each other were doing. Like you didn't get married and then start to building a business together. You started asking questions with each other while you were dating. Is that is that correct? Did I did I get that right? Yeah, but uh, you know, in all honesty, we're uh, you know, and another thing that makes us very compatible, we're a bit of extremists as well. Uh, so um, I think it was it was early on in our relationship that we knew that we wanted to be together. And <laughs> she would tell the whole world what it was. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> he proposed two weeks after we met. Let's oh, just... my gosh. Oh, that's so fun. great. Wow. Yeah. When you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, definitely. Yes, definitely. Yes, so it's so... one of those things that we. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm the speechless myself. <laughs> That's incredible, you guys. Wow, what a great story. I honestly think there could be a book there with that. Anyway, <laughs> um, what I want to do is I, I know this is awesome. And, and I know that there's more to discuss about this. That we can weave into the conversation later on. But I want to start pivoting right now and really providing some knowledge equity to our listeners here. And mainly to talk about what is it you guys are pros in. You guys are pros in cross-border investing from Canada and into the United United States. So if you don't mind, I have a few questions I'd like to ask, and then we can kind of see how the conversation goes, if that works for you. Of course, yeah. So first thing is, you guys mentioned in your bio and also on your website, that you only invest in the best assets that you guys handpick for your investors and for yourselves, right? Could you guys talk a little bit about what that criteria is? What do you guys use to narrow down all the options out there to pick only the best properties? Yeah, for okay. sure. So it starts with the region. Once we figure out the regions that we want to be in, we have a, a certain asset criteria. That's an institutional sized, 100 plus doors, garden style, multifamily apartment community. And it's going to be 
anything with a value add component where we can go in there and force appreciate the value of the asset usually has a third party property manager, an office, a leasing office right on site. And then, yeah. Do yeah. You want to add to any yeah. Of that? Just to add to it, I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back and I sure. add to it in a way that, okay, we're already real estate professionals. I'm involved in ground up development. She's involved helping investors. So when we came to the space of what we wanted to do, this concept of real estate, private equity or syndication, where just to make it very simple is finding a deal, finding investors, hiring all the professionals that are needed to execute the business plan, and then getting a portion of the profits relative to the performance of the project. This is, this is essentially what we wanted to do. Now, we weren't involved in a particular type of asset class strategy. I was doing ground up development. I knew that's not what I wanted to do because of the issues that I was facing here in Vancouver with the city bureaucracies and the timelines mm -hmm. and the public hearings and environmental, all, all these issues that went with ground up development, rezoning and what have you. So I knew I didn't want to be in, in that particular asset class. So we looked within the space to see what is the best performing asset class. And to find that best performing asset class, we looked at what do we want to provide to our investors? What is it that is our investors' pain points today? And it was, we looked at the large cities in Canada, Vancouver and Toronto, people could invest in real estate. First issue was it was too expensive to buy real estate. And in most cases, they were in negative cash flow. So we wanted to provide appreciation and cash flow to our investors. Mm -hmm. And we looked within the real estate space and we're like, what is the asset class? What is the property type that can provide both of these? What is the pro property type that has done well through the last two financial crises that, that existed? And that's when we found a multifamily value add. Now within the multifamily space as well, there's you know different classes, different strategies. You, know, you could buy a 20 unit apartment building, but it won't have certain benefits that these larger assets have. So we went and research to find the best asset class to invest into rather than being already involved in the space. And the reason we ended up at the type of properties we invest in, which is which are 100 plus doors or 200 plus doors, institutional, multifamily, with a value add component in the sun built states where there is uh, certain metrics, job growth, population growth, income growth, rent growth. And the reason for that, for all these metrics to exist for this particular asset class is because it reduces risk. And that's the business we're in. We're in the business of reducing risk as much as possible. There's risk within any business. When you're dealing with investors, your number one goal internally should be capital preservation. Your number two goal should be capital growth. So this particular asset class, this particular property type, this particular business strategy had the best risk reward that existed within the real estate ecosystem, in my opinion. And that's why we went ahead with this property type asset class. Well said. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that asymmetrical risk return ratio is something that all investors should be looking for. And I want to applaud you guys for doing the research and putting in the work to deliver them for your investors. And you guys have certainly reaped the rewards and, and also all of the, the benefits that comes with building a business with it as well. So congratulations to you guys on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that I want to, because I want to kind of pare this down for Canadian investor, our Canadian investor friends, right? There is a lot of legal hurdles, right? I figured out when doing this last uh, acquisition, where we're working with Canadian investors through a syndication, that each province has their own different rules. In the United States, you have the SEC, so it's, it's easier to do that. Can you guys talk about the overall basic legal structure that you guys use to hold title or to work with partners in the United States and how that works? Like, are you doing a tick uh, at title level or are you just taking over as an LP and then you have a structure down from there? Uh, please, if you guys could provide a little bit of insight there, that would be great. For sure. Two parts to that. So you got the compliance side of it, dealing with securities, and you got the cross-border taxation, relief from double taxation, the tax efficiency side of right. it. And they right, need right. to be in sync for it to alleviate issues and concerns we might have for raising capital, and it alleviates any issues that investors have for investing in these types of structures. So a lot of content that exists online for Canadians looking to invest into the U.S., the content is more created for Canadians looking to buy a piece of property in the US, buying an investment property. And the strategies and the structures needed to put into place to buy a property in the US is a lot different than what we're doing with uh, real estate private equity. Mm -hmm. So for us, the first step is obviously the compliance side of it. It's what exemption to use to raise capital and uh, the processes. So it's in some ways, it might be a big 
easier, but in most ways is much more difficult to raise capital here in Canada. And it is provincial. Yeah. It is provincial yeah. provinces. Uh, certain provinces have different rules and guidelines and what have you. Uh, so the decision we've made is actually that all our securities are uh, are sold through an exempt market dealer. I think in the yeah. U.S. it's called a broker dealer. Yeah. Uh, you guys, mm -hmm. that's a term that's used in the U.S. So all our securities are sold through EMD. So we do create educational content mm -hmm. and we do have uh, meetings and events on the educational side of it when people reach out and say hey we love what you guys are doing we forward them to our emd who then completes the sale of the securities that's basically how it works now as far as the structure that we create for tax efficiency we, we use a fund of fund structure so we have a canadian fund now this term fund also kind of gets uh, misconstrued sometimes a fund is just any entity that raises any type of capital any, any entity that any capital is put into that's called, called a fund fund is also a lot of time in real estate associated with a, with an entity that continuously raises capital and then continuously deploys that capital and buys property. So, so, but we're, when I'm not talking about a fund, I'm just talking about a, an entity, an SPV, a single a purpose vehicle. So we create a Canadian fund, the investors in, invest into the Canadian fund as LPs, and then we create a U.S. fund, which owns the asset, and then the Canadian fund invests into the U.S. fund. That's the kind of the okay. fund of fund structure that we've created. Now, on the U.S. side, depend because we also have U.S. investors who invest into the investment as well. On the U.S. side, we comply by the SEC regulation, depending on what exemption we use to raise capital. So, for example, if we use the 506C, which requires all the investors to be accredited, our U.S. investors are accredited and they have to be verified by third party. Now, for our Canadian fund to then also be considered accredited, the SEC requires for the fund to be considered accredited, the SEC requires for that fund to either have a over $5 million of, of holdings of basically we've got to raise over $5 million or it requires that every single one of the investors are accredited. are accredited. That's how we we go by the so we have so it's a bit more cumbersome for it's us a, because we're yeah. dealing with the US securities yeah. and of Canadian. course. And, of and course. there's no third party accreditation companies here in Canada. So that's another process where we have to do every investor has to go through a verification that well, it's, a bit, it's a bit great on the on the, yeah. on the Canadian side on the US is very clear that, yes. that this is the process. Canadian security size it doesn't really say anything about a third party or doesn't say anything about accreditation, it puts the onus back on the GP. But in a case of auditing, if we're getting audited by the securities, they want to know what steps did we take to make sure that our investors are accredited. In our case, what we've done is we just passed the puck. I use a Canadian pass analogy. Pass the puck to our EMD. He does the accreditation. So we're not, if, an, if, an, if an investor came to us, it's not just August and Ava saying, hey, the, the investor said they're accredited. It's actually the EMD yes. who goes through the KYC, KYP, and uh, other processes it, yeah. and uh, oh. yeah, other processes. Now, do you guys, is it okay if I ask you guys, did it, did it always start this way? Or did you guys start doing like individual entities and, and going that way? Because I know it takes some time for you to build up the traction and the, the clout and the following to be able to raise that type of money, right? Uh, how did it work out when you guys first started? Were you guys doing mostly stuff in Canada or were you still doing cross-border things at the beginning? Long answer for you here. Long <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, and this is very interesting. I think I think your your viewers and listeners will get a lot of benefit from from our experience here because I learned a lot of things, even though I thought I knew everything there is to know in real estate and and <laughs> partnerships and what have you. Learn. Always more. Yeah. yeah so when we yeah. first started out, the plan was for CPI Capital to be an operating company, that being being a sponsor, being a general partner, but being an operating company. So meaning that. The, you know, we have an asset management team in house, we find the properties, we do the physical due diligence, uh, we purchase these properties, we do the renovation, we have our own team, that was a plan, because that's how I conducted all my business, mm -hmm. uh, all my years. But when we first started out, we realized that, hey, we're got, we have some issues. Number one, we have no track record. Number two is this item that we're talking about is more of a concept. We haven't done a deal yet. So when we're talking about investors, they're going to be relieved from double taxation. We haven't had any track record to prove that. So initially, when we started out, the plan was to be everything, the operational side. But we realized there's so much time being spent on cultivating and nurturing relationship with investors yeah. and also creating a lot of content that we create for ourselves and for our investor community. There was so much work being done on that side of it, the investor relations side of it, that we were a bit overextended to then 
also spent time on the acquisition and the management side of the operations. And plus, we didn't have the, we didn't have any track record, not in the U.S. Structures in place. Or infrastructure yeah. in place. Yeah. And what, what, what do you mean? What Ava mean by infrastructure in yeah. place is if you wanted to invest in Arizona, you need to have the connections with brokers who bring you deals. You need to have your uh, asset manager on the ground. You need to have your property managers. Your asset manager looks after your property managers, site visits, and so on and so forth. You need to have your teams there, your lawyers for closing, escrow, and all the other stuff. So that's the infrastructure we didn't have in place. Mm-hmm. So we, out of desperation, we made the decision to, to partner with active operators in there again they started with the region so we say hey what region do we want to be in what is the asset class we want to invest into who are the operators that we want to partner with who are going to act as our boots on the ground that we feel comfortable with partnering with like what is the items that we need from the from this operator and that's when we made a decision to partner with other operators to purchase the properties we bought but then while utilizing this business model and still planning to be the operator we realized that hey this is creating actually a really interesting and very you know we talk about risk right this is actually lowering the risk and i'll explain how that works it's like okay we want to be in these regions we want to be in nevada arizona texas florida north and south carolina great we want to have our boots on the ground in these regions who are focused in these regions who for example have at least a hundred million dollars of assets under management have already taken a deal through his full cycle and returned pack, a capital back to their investors have experience in renovations and and so on and so forth so okay great we made the contact with those operators we did some deals but then what we notice is as we're waiting for deals to be presented to us by our operators they're sending us deals the deals that they had underwritten, they must have underwritten at least 500 deals before putting a deal yeah. on their contract. Yes. By the time that deal gets to us, now we're sitting back and cherry picking the best deals our operators are sending to us. So that by the time we make the decision to partner with one of our operating partners to bring the deal to our investors, by that time is a very great deal with a lot of benefits to it. So, so the business ended up, model ended up yeah. being a really, really positive and beneficial for us because now our investors know that we're cherry picking the best deals from these regions. So they're diversified in their portfolio by investing with CPI capital as well. So it actually all really ended up working out quite. Yeah. I would also say to you guys is that you guys didn't have to build out an infrastructure to do the underwriting and to do the asset management, to do all of that stuff, because you've got these wonderful boots on the ground partners who are bringing them to you. Assuming that you guys know what you're looking at, obviously, right? Which you do. I think that's the important thing is that you didn't have to build out the huge infrastructure to do all of this. And that isn't part of the time that you take. You just specialize in what is it you guys want to do, which you guys are world-class at it right now. And that's that's fantastic. So a couple of very quick things. So we do have our internal underwriting team that we put together. So any deal that comes to us, we still put it through our underwriting process and and, and sure. also, yeah. I mean, we learned a lot there, but also now for compliance side on the uh, for the SEC, uh, we can't just be allocators. We can't just come in and raise capital and yeah. become co-GPs. We need to have actual operational duties. So Correct. our operational duties include meetings with uh, our asset manager, meeting with property managers, which are also recorded a lot of times because of my construction backgrounds, I'm asking a lot August of questions just from, asking the questions. From, 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 from the poor um, yeah. asset manager. I'm asking, like he talks about, you know, the capital expenditure and what have you. So even though the infrastructure is not in place, the involvement is definitely there still. Absolutely, yeah. Got it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was referring to is that the infrastructure behind you having a, a full on team, right? Like that's now part of your, your business model. No, you have someone that's definitely part of your team that's double checking all the underwriting in the business plan and, and making sure that you guys, because that's that's an extension of you that you're delegating to an internal team that you've already built out. So just wanted yeah. to make that clear as well. But yeah, you're right. I think we're saying the same thing. Yes, yeah, for definitely. sure. And keep in mind, you guys, imagine going to a group of investors when you have no track record, say, hey, give me your money, <laughs> purchase some U.S. multifamily, and I'm going returns. <laughs> what could go wrong, you guys, right? <laughs> like, you know. Right? Never mind about compliance or taxation. It's never, it's not a big deal. Um, I wanted to, I have two questions to ask. I think Sophie will ask one, but I wanted to ask one more, which is taxation, double taxation, right? That's something that is, I guess you can get around it through the Canadian U.S. tax treaty, but you have to meet certain requirements. And, and you know, we're dealing with this, with this right now in, in our investment. I wanted to talk to you guys about a little bit about how the taxation works. Can you maybe explore for people who are getting into their first investment, who are accredited, uh, they're joining you, what is it they're going to have to do investing in U.S. assets to get the tax credit or, or what that process looks like? 
For sure, for sure. So all Canadian investors are required to obtain an ITIN number, um, which is equivalent to a SIN number if any Canadians are listening. And you are required to also file yearly uh, U.S. annual taxes to the IRS. And so then my understanding is, is that once you pay those taxes, if it is in a legal structure or it follows chain of title through it's not considered a foreign entity, right? It's, it's done through a limited partnership or however title is held. There's a clear chain of title going up to the property being held in title. Um, if there is that chain there, then unless I'm mistaken, you should be able to take the U.S. taxes paid and apply that to the amount that you owe to the can Canadian government. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So when on the profits made on the back end when we sell the asset, the IRS does a withholding tax. And then essentially what happens is when the rest of the funds come back to Canada, the CRA recognizes that you paid the IRS, let's say 20%, then you're given a foreign tax credit of 20% here in Canada and you're relieved dollar for dollar on double taxation. Excellent. It depends on your tax bracket though, right? Yeah, so, so depending on your tax bracket, then you have to pay the difference. So if um, your tax bracket, for example, on those profits, on those capital gains is 30%, you're paying the difference. So you're paying 10% more to the Canadian. Exactly. I don't think it's that high. I should, I should have used 25%. <laughs> there you go. That's fine. Yeah. So, you know, in the United States, we have these things called accelerated depreciation. We have cost segregation, that type of thing. My assumption is, and just so you guys can clarify this for me, is that most of our friends north of the border will not be able to take advantage of that in the unless they have a U.S. entity where it's like a, they're investing as a U.S. investor and then they can take advantage of that as a real estate professional in the United States. Absolutely. But that, that doesn't apply in Canada, right? Yeah, the Canadian tax laws do not recognize the, the bonus depreciation. That not flow through. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But, but there, but there, 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 are there are other depreciation benefits that the Canadian tax law does allow you to utilize. Well, guess what, you guys, listeners out there who are north of the border and want to find out more, you're just going to have to talk with Ava and August about this. <laughs> and just on your, on your other point of Canadians, so there are Canadians who do invest in the U.S., uh, utilizing a U.S. entity. Now, this is that process is totally fine. You can invest into a U.S., buy a property through a U.S. entity you've created or invest with U.S. syndicators or operators or sponsors through creating an entity in the U.S. And a lot of them, that's what they ask. They're like, hey, create an entity, invest through an entity, and you're great. You can invest with us. But the concern is not just the process of investing. The concern is repatriating your profits back to Canada. If that's the final goal, that's when you're going to head, you know, head snags, particularly using an LLC, which is not right. very tax efficient. And now you paid your tax on the U.S. side and you'll be double tax paying up to 70 percent of your profits in taxes. Nobody wants uh, but that. if you're not planning to repatriate your monies, for example, Ava and I are planning to move to the U.S. So for us, it makes sense to invest in the U.S. for our own investments through a U.S. entity, use the tax benefits that exist on that entity, and then not repatriate the funds, leave it there for either when we're there or continuously reinvest them and utilize other great tax benefits like a 1031 exchange for tax deferral, right. which we don't have here in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, you know what? I, for one, am so happy that we're going to have some more American friends here soon. <laughs> it's Canadians. really great. Canadian, oh, right. Canadian yeah. expats into the, or I guess, I don't know what you call it, but, <laughs> but new, new transplants into the United States. It'd be great to have you guys here. We'd totally. love it. Yeah. So do you want to ask a question? Yeah. So, um, you know, just again, listening to everything you shared and all of your expertise and your experience, my question is what, for both of you, what continues to surprise and delight you? What continues to surprise <laughs> and delight me? Mm, let me see. One of the five, I mean, I'll, I'll be a bit uh, satirical and funny over here, but it's, um, I think what continues to surprise and delight me is when we do our company goals and we're trying to set our goals for 2022 and we have our uh, CFO who assists us and he's, a, he's, a, yeah. he's very serious and he's, a, he's, a, he's very corporate <laughs> yes. and we're all, we always very fun. So he's like, yeah, what are the goals and the plans for this year for you guys? And he's got racy charts and racy all these different things. <laughs> so what, you know, surprises and delights me is that how high Ava sets the goals for us when it comes to number of investors and the capital raising and the size of assets and the AUM. So she's, she's always, she's much more conservative than me in most cases, risk averse. But when it comes to setting goals, she always sets the bar pretty high. I always love it. I'm like, we're, let's do a deal. He's like, are you sure we're ready to do another deal? Are you sure? I'm like, no, we're going to do this deal. And then of course I surprise him there. You perform. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> um, what continues to surprise and delight me? Oh gosh. Are we talking about our significant others? Cause I want to maybe. Sure. Please. Both. Yeah. Both in business and anything. 
August and his ideas, again, like I mentioned before, but he's really, really good at coming up with creative ways to get our company in front of more people and to partner with other people and all this stuff. So I have to say it's almost on a daily basis. I'm not just saying that every single day. I know that there's some sort of cool creative thing that he's going to come up with and present to the team. And we're like, okay, that sounds like fun. Couple of things on that. So even a broken clock is right twice a day. So uh, I I, I throw out a lot of ideas and some of them end up being great. So that's one thing. But the negative of being creative and having a lot of ideas is everybody's time and resources are limited. So if you have all these great ideas and they all sound great, but then you overextend yourself and uh, you know, run yourself thin. It's not conducive to managing them. So a lot of times Ava and our team has to bring me back down and saying, hey, let's keep our focus. I'm like, hey, there's this great self storage <laughs> deal. Let's do it. Hey, there's this Canadian. I know we don't want to do Canadian deals, but there's a great Canadian deal. We can double our investors' money in three years. I'm like, like oh, August, no. right now, this we're is our mandate. on U.S. multifamily value. Okay? And I'm like, well, we'll That's... get there. We'll get there, but let's stay with you. That's so great. It guys. sounds familiar. <laughs> I know it's it's lovely to see that because there's always like you know the person who pushes the gas and the person who pushes the brakes and then the visionary integrator but it sounds like you guys have both happening all at once and um yeah just yeah lovely. it's really good just lovely <laughs> so I, I have one last question for you and I, I hate to bring it all the way back to the boring topic of cross-border <laughs> investing right no, no. <laughs> um I wanted to talk to you guys about like you guys obviously have a very strong marketing strategy. You guys are reaching out with investors all the time and you're mostly in the education business. So I wanted to talk about how your marketing strategy has evolved over time um, because I know there's all these different platforms, right? And can you guys talk about how you guys have moved with the times and what that's been like for you guys having to readapt? Yeah, for me to look at it, I mean, um, I was at a, a summit with our a great mentor and friend, Dan Hanford in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, I remember in, sitting in class or in, in the setting, I asked the question, hey, if you had to put all your eggs in one basket and utilize one uh, medium or one platform to connect or create content, what would it be? And I kind of got in trouble for asking that yeah, question in class. He kind of, uh, you know, called me out. Dan <laughs> called me out. He's like, but the analogy he used is having more fishing rods out, you're going to catch more, catch more fish. So for us, you know, initially starting out, the idea for us was creating some sort of content. So, uh, we, you know, we started our YouTube show, we, you know, and, and the reason we went with a YouTube show rather than a podcast, even though we're planning to turn our YouTube show to, into a podcast is because we enjoy being in front of camera and we enjoy that connection that we have with people on camera. So it's whatever that works best for you. Yes. So the first thing was creating some form of content and then that, that show- Creating up, content creating to content. become thought leaders so that people can know, like, and trust us. It's super important in this business to have the know, like, and trust. So just by giving out content consistently, being seen everywhere with all the fishing rods, um, people have that know, like, and trust very quickly as opposed to just meeting you know myself on on zoom one day and having a quick conversation by the time they get on the zoom with me they're like oh my gosh i've seen you here 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 and here thank you so much for teaching me that i learned a lot there um and then yeah. i really created that strong for sure and just to add to, to that, that a bit more so you cre- you're creating content on your on your main platform but then you can refurbish the same content on your other platforms on linkedin on facebook on instagram mm-hmm. you can take snippets and what having use it so now people are seeing you different places even though all the content came from the same location but it's also important to get yourself involved in, you know, in other places. I mean, it, would talk, it talks about thought leader and like definition of thought leader is someone who, you know, has a following and creates a lot of content and sends it out and they're trusted and they're at times are even paid for the content they create. And, mm-hmm. you know, we got our first check uh, just over a year ago when we spoke on uh, on a summit and recently we got another check and it, these are nominal amounts. We're not doing it for any kind of monetized yeah. reasons. But we, we, our goal is to be thought leaders within our space. So marketing is a huge part of our business, being creative within that marketing space to create content, adding value. And the value you're adding is obviously free value that you're adding to people and then bringing them into your tribe, bringing them into your funnel, bringing into your a database yeah. and then continuously to nurture and so when you have a deal yeah. that at least know you enough because our business like Ava was mentioning earlier is hey listen investor investor come and give me your money <laughs> i'm going to take your money and invest with it on, 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 on in you know, you're in vancouver the farthest point in north america is orlando so we literally <laughs> had invest so we're going to go invest over there we're going to take care of everything and unfortunately if you lose your money you can't do anything about it 
So there needs to be a lot of trust trust. that exists there. Obviously, you don't want to lose investors' money because if you're losing people's money, people are not going to reinvest with you and there's not going to be a long-term business model. But again, to create that trust, the marketing side is very important. The creating content is very important, giving that free content. So hope that answers it. Yeah, it it absolutely did. And and thank you guys. One thing I wanted to, or a couple of things I just wanted to add before we head into the rapid round here is that you guys, it seems like you're in the marketing business you're educating people because you're walking people through your funnel. And that's your primary business function right now is to educate people. And how do you get people to educate? Well, it's through your marketing platforms. It's through reaching people, reaching out to people and then letting those referrals come in. And then they're going to cross check you because they have to, you first have to be visible. Then they have to know you, then like you, then trust you before they invest. And and the other thing that I was going to say too about this is as I'm listening to this, it's very clear is that the things that you guys are building is scalable. There are ways in which you can just do one-to-ones, but that's your time. There's only so much time that you have in a day. But if you're building these processes and funnels and putting video out there that anyone can view with the right algorithm or the right search results or whatever, then you guys have the ability to scale infinitely, or at least to however many people there are on the planet or some factor of that. (laughs) Anyways, so that being said, you guys, man, what great nuggets of wisdom here. I have so much notes here. He's I don't just know been highlighting away. Like, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost the entire transcript is like green right now. So that's awesome. But what I want to do is I want to transition over into our rapid round, which is the same five questions that we ask every one of our guests. And so we're going to rapidly ask them to you if you guys are ready. And they're meant to be answered in about a 30 second time frame, uh, one for each person. Okay. Tables have turned. We usually rapid fire. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. We will read alternate reading questions and I'll start here. So the first one is what book has had the biggest impact on each of you and why? And we ask that it not be Rich Dad, Poor Dad or the Bible because we always get that. (laughs) Um, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Ooh, Um, second time in a row. Wow. Yeah. Learn how to be a master delegator. Your business will thrive. Love it. For me, it was Sapien. It was, it was a book uh, that uh, learned a lot about life and, and the human origins and what have you. So it's not really a finance or real estate related book. Uh, what, I was, what I'll say about Rich Dad Poor Dad is when I read it, it didn't make any sense to me at all because uh, I didn't have to be a converter or believer of this concept of not you know, changing your time for, for money or having to be believe that, you know, going to school, getting a job, working until 65 and then retiring. I, I never believed that concept anyway. So for me, it was more shocking of how many people that book has converted. So that was a shocking part of Rich Dad for that. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Really good tip on that book too, by the way. But Absolutely. Anyway. Next question, guys, is if people wanted to emulate your success, what is the first actionable thing that they could do to follow in your footsteps? I would say starting out with a a thought leadership platform or some form of content that you create. The great thing, for example, with our YouTube show is that as we bring on these expert guests and we interview them, we learn uh, because it's a a show that we've booked in people for the next three months. We know it's coming up. We have to do research on our guests. So it's an educational internally for us as well. And also externally creates content to help us with our business and what have you. And we make some great friends with people from all around the world who've been on our show. Very cool. What is one tool, process, or hack in the last three months that have helped you save time and or effort? And that's for each of you. Um, I'm going to go with our marketing. Okay, you know what? I'm going to go with our uh, HubSpot. I can do one post to all of our social media accounts. Um, Hits Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn doing one post. Love that. (laughs) Very cool. For me, I'll I'll quickly say my, sorry. (laughs) For me, it would be um, book summaries. So a lot of times there's so many books being suggested. There's a lot lot of YouTube videos and there's certain websites that actually do a summary of the book. So they have it all packed into one quick summary. So you can learn about a book, uh, you know, read it like the the most important parts of the book in 20 or 30 minutes rather than spending a few hours reading a book. And sometimes that takes forever (laughs) sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, August, that's so good. I have the story around. I need to read the whole book. <laughs> so I have a library of books that I'd like to stack up, but that's a great hack. So thank you so much for that. And um, next question is, if the people you know had to describe you with one word, what would that be? Mine would be uh, caring. Mine would be trustworthy. Yeah, awesome. very much. I can see both those words in you guys. Awesome. 
And the last question that we have is, what small thing do most people not know about you? That people don't know about me. I mean, I, well, especially particularly in the in the business world, uh, I used to box um, cool. as an amateur and a, and a bunch of fights. So mm -hmm. I guess um, you know they might not know that I used to be a fighter. That's awesome. Cool. And about me, I'm, I'm, I'm an athlete, I guess. So I played like club basketball, hockey, rugby. I don't look like it, but I, I, yeah, I was a little bit of an athlete. Flex those muscles. Awesome. She's, she's got some muscle. Yeah. She's got some muscle. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Run first money all the time when it comes yeah, to Yeah, love it, love it. Well, hey, you guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. But before we go, uh, we just want to make sure that the listeners out there um, have a chance to learn more about where you guys are, uh, you know, how to find out more about you. So I'm just going to give you guys an open stage here for about 30 seconds for you to say wherever people can find more about you. Incredible. We both love LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Ava Benasaki. We're very active on there. Or you can check us out on our website, www.cpicapital.ca. Yeah, I would say the same thing, cpicapital.ca. We have our uh, YouTube show, Canadian Passive Investing. Uh, also on LinkedIn, you can just search for CPI Capital. Our company will pop up and then we're connected to there. And yeah, love to connect with you. If you have some yeah. more questions about cross-border investing, if you have questions about how to, you know, we build a company with your couple, uh, you know, give us a call. Give us a call. We'll tell <laughs> you. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. that's so great it's super fun you guys it's super yeah. fun. i can't yeah. wait to learn more about you guys because i can see that you guys are well connected. we're gonna have you on our show yeah. just for sure now. we'd love to we'd love to be there but thank you guys so much for coming on ours we had a blast with you guys here and for all you listeners out there who are uh, listening with us and have listened all the way to the end to hear these incredibly great jabs that we're taking at each other <laughs> <laughs> please wherever you see this or, or are listening to this content please like subscribe comment engage with us because we want to be more interactive with you and provide more value by bringing on excellent guests such as Ava and August here and uh, the more you do that the more we start appeasing those algorithm gods and we can start moving up the moving up the height to try to get ourselves up to uh, closer to bigger pockets, which would be fantastic. So. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> so thank you everyone for listening. And Ava, August, thank you once again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. you guys are great. Absolutely. Thanks. You thank too. You. you too. And thank you listener for listening. And this is Derek. And this is Sophie. We are signing off for the day. Thanks everyone. Bye.